Well, look, enough said about the Middle East Institute. Uh, what I am really very thrilled and honored to be able to do uh, at this point is to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, a, a man who is a personal friend of mine. I first met Bill Burns, Under Secretary Bill Burns, in 1982 when we were both uh, very junior officers. He was on his first tour in Amman, Jordan. And I'll have to tell you, even then, it was very, it was very evident to all of us, but uh, to me in particular, that this was an officer who was going straight to the top in our career service, and he has. Uh, Bill's career is chocker block full of accomplishments. Uh, I'll mention only a few because he's here and we're all waiting to hear him and not me. Uh, but Ambassador Burns uh, uh, was a key player on Secretary Baker's inner circle of advisors during the, the Mid Madrid talks in 1991. He has served twice as ambassador to two challenging countries, uh, Jordan and Russia. He is, was Assistant Secretary of the Near East, uh, of the Bureau of Near East Affairs uh, from 2001 to 2005. Uh, and Bill provided exceptional leadership to NEA, which those of us, those of us career officers that have served in NEA affectionately call the Mother Bureau. Uh, he maintained that tradition well as a, its leader. Uh, Ambassador Burns was promoted by the last administration to the highest position that a career Foreign Service officer can aspire to in the Foreign Service, and that is Undersecretary for Political Affairs. As a tribute to his accomplishments uh, and his talents, uh, Secretary Clinton asked him to stay on in that position when the administrations changed, and he is now one of her closest advisors. Secretary Burns has a great deal to share with us this morning, including, uh, I hope, his reflections as the senior most American official who has been dealing face to face uh, with uh, Iranians on the, uh, some of the trickier issues that we face. Um, Bill, it's our honor to welcome you here today. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak again at the Middle East Institute, for whose leadership, membership, and mission I have enormous respect. There are a lot of different strategies for appearing before a group as formidable and well-informed as all of you are. Mark Twain, I'm told, had a simple approach. It is my custom, he said, to keep talking until I have my audience cowed. Um, another of my favorite authors, George Bernard Shaw, was an advocate of a less long-winded strategy. Hosting an, event in <coughs> hosting an event in London one day, Shaw was approached by the first speaker who asked how long he should speak for. Shaw replied that he should probably limit his remarks to about 20 minutes. The speaker looked at him in horror and said, 20 minutes? How am I supposed to tell them everything I know in 20 minutes? And Shaw paused and replied, in your case, my advice would be to speak very slowly. Um, uh, in my case this morning, you don't have to worry about me going much beyond 20 minutes, even if I speak very slowly. So, uh, so I'll spare you Mark Twain's strategy, try my best to emulate George Bernard Shaw, and offer only a few brief thoughts on America and the Middle East and the new era unfolding before us. In my checkered career as an American diplomat, I've divided my labors mostly between two nice, boring areas, the Middle East and Russia. And given my extraordinary track record of achievement in those two areas, you should probably be worried about where they might send me next. <laughs> but in the course of my professional efforts, I've learned a few things, sometimes the hard way, about America and the Middle East. I've certainly learned that we do not have the luxury of ignoring a part of the world that holds some of our closest friends, two-thirds of the world's oil reserves, several of the world's most poisonous regional conflicts, and violent extremists who feed on the region's bitterness and alienation. I've learned that a little humility goes a long way in the exercise of American power and purpose in the Middle East. We come by that humility honestly through many trials and many errors. Winston Churchill, a lifelong admirer of America, once said that the thing he liked most about Americans was that they always did the right thing in the end, 
They just like to exhaust all the alternatives first. <laughs> the latter describes much of our historical experience in the Middle East. The former is an outcome to which we always aspire. I've learned that America can lead more effectively through the power of our example than through the power of our preaching. I've learned that other people and other societies have their own realities, not always identical or hospitable to ours. That doesn't mean that we have to accept them or indulge them, but it does mean that understanding them is the starting point for successful policy. I've learned that stability is not a static phenomenon. To borrow an analogy used by one of your very deserving award winners last night, both political systems and peace processes, like bicycles, tend to fall over if they're not moving forward. I've learned that the Middle East has many good and decent people who seek dignity and respect and a better life for their children, and a few great leaders, like the late King Hussein of Jordan, a man of uncommon courage and vision who died shortly after I began my tenure as ambassador in Amman more than a decade ago. I've learned, too, that the Middle East is a region of deep discontents and powerful grievances, many of which roll to arrest, rightly or wrongly, at the doorstep of the United States. I've learned that there is no substitute for determined American leadership in the Middle East aimed squarely at addressing the problems at the core of some of those real or imagined grievances and serving as a catalyst for making common cause with others. And I've learned that we must be clear not only about what we stand against, but also what we stand for. In his speech in Cairo last June, President Obama spoke far more eloquently than I ever could about what America stands for in this new era. He called for a new beginning based on mutual interest and mutual respect. We've been working hard, starting well before that historic speech, to translate the President's compelling vision into practical policy, to begin the long, difficult process of turning rhetoric into results. That is not easy. It never has been in the Middle East, a land where dreams are regularly shattered, where good intentions regularly run aground, and where pessimists rarely lack either company or validation. Progress means applying mutual interest in a way that builds on common ground wherever it exists, but doesn't shy away from dealing plainly with our differences wherever it doesn't. It means translating mutual respect into an approach that doesn't patronize or pretend to a monopoly on wisdom that shows that listening is occasionally something other than an unnatural act for Americans, but that also shows no hesitation in speaking honestly to both our friends and our adversaries about the importance we attach to universal human rights. It means exercising our responsibility to lead, to set a good example, to help resolve regional conflicts, to help build coalitions in support of a new positive agenda. But it also means that others in the region and outside it must live up to their responsibilities, whether in upholding nonproliferation norms or taking risks for peace. Progress is possible toward realizing the President's vision, toward realizing a positive agenda for the Middle East. Such progress is the ultimate antidote to the fundamentally negative agenda of violent extremists, who are much better at describing what they want to destroy rather than what they want to build. America's contribution to a positive agenda has many parts, and today I will highlight only a few of them. They include building peace between Israelis and Arabs, supporting the emergence of a new Iraq at peace with itself and its neighbors, dealing with the challenge of Iran, and building economic and political hope in a region which for too long has known too little of either. This is not an a la carte policy menu. We cannot successfully neglect one priority in the pursuit of others. Progress will inevitably be uneven, but it is important to connect the dots among issues and pursue a comprehensive strategy. 